Okay, here we are looking at what's going on on the margins of the uh, popular music scene during our time frame. I may sneeze here, so don't be too freaked out. Mm. <sighs> okay, I guess it's just a faker sneeze. Those really are the worst kind. So, um, in the 1970s in particular, there are new genres that are crossing over. Um, and established genres that continue to splinter. And here I'm talking specifically about rock because from the 70s on through to the 90s, rock really did uh, establish and maintain a two to one um, advantage uh, over the next leading genre. And so no matter what was in second place in terms of the most uh, sales, uh, mostly you know records, um, rock was always two times bigger than, than the second place genre. So as we saw in the 1960s, um, with rock splintering into folk rock and psychedelic rock, now we're going to have additional permutations of, uh, of the rock genre in the 1970s. Um, so yeah, let's check out the next slide, shall we? <laughs> Sorry about that. I have a dog that will spontaneously freak out on the world. Okay. All right. So um, one thing that is interesting about the music business in terms of genre is that revivalism is one of these cycles that is constantly at work in, um, in the music industry. There are a couple of different cycles that are like that, but we'll we'll focus on revivalism for now. Um, and usually there's about a 20 year lag, um, meaning that in the 1970s, there's a certain fascination with the 1950s. In the 1980s, there's a certain fascination with the 60s. In the 2000s, I remember people were really crazy about like doing the safety dance and all these weird 1980s tunes. Um, and so revivalism is simply there, and I think it has as much to do with human psychology. When you get 20 years past something that was, um, that, you know, was an experience that was a major or you know, an experience that marked you in some way, you really can measure yourself and your development. And there's a certain fascination. I don't know what it is, but when you look back over that amount of time, so for you guys listening to this, uh, most of whom are my students in your 20s, you're going to have to get a little older before you can see, unless you're like really into crib memories or whatever. Anywho, um, so like I said, this is a television and entertainment industry cycle, so you can see it across, um, you know, television and Happy Days and MASH in the 70s. Those are both 50s based shows, film with Grease and American Graffiti, once again, 70s shows that are based in the 50s. And then I remember growing up watching Sha Na Na, which is really hilarious. But this was like a TV show in the 70s that um, was based on like these this greaser doo-wop gang that wears gold suits. And um, these guys actually performed at Woodstock, believe it or not. In any case... Um, you know, they have celebrities on and she comes out and tells bad jokes and insults them and everything. And um, it's just one of those things, you know. Let's hear, there's their sign off song. I'm kind of interested to hear it. So they all have parts that they play. It's kind of sketch comedy with songs. And I didn't know there were so many of those dudes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. In any case, um, 
point is made about the um, revivalism cycle that's built into the music business. So you always know what's coming and you can actually try to, you know, make a move on one of these genres by looking, okay, well, we're going to be in the 2010s next. So what were the big things or the 2020s coming up? What was big in the 2000s? Um, and position yourself accordingly as a um, music industry participant. Um, so retrospective music in the 1970s naturally was kind of a 50s vibe. So Stray Cats were probably um, the most visible, but they got um, they didn't get started until the late 70s. Sha Na Na um, was a made-for-TV uh, band. You know, they go on tour. American Pie, um, famous song by Don McLean, um, is retelling the story of the day the music died, which of course was a plane crash that took the lives of um, several of the 1950s biggest stars, Big Boppy, Big Bopper, uh, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, etc. Um, and then you've got, you know, lesser known artists. So this is a video that I like because it's just weird. So Jeff Lynn here, uh, lead singer uh, for ELO, also guitar player. So the Electric Light Orchestra, if you're into 70s music. Well, when he got started, um, he joined with a guy by the name of Ron Wood, and they formed a band called The Move, which is great. Okay, I'm going to turn that down, but um, this is a prime example. This is in England, so it's a little weirder, but <laughs> nothing against the English. You can see they've all got their 50s clothing on, uh, except for Jeff Lynn. He looks a little bit 60s there with his Beatles get up. Um, but if you listen to this music and you check out the guy with the stand-up bass and the horns and everything, it's like basically the 1970s reaching back to the 50s. <laughs> So that was Roy Wood with the yellow glasses who looks like a total burnout, that dude right there. Um, so anyway, it's <laughs> in its own 70s way. It's kind of freaky and hilarious at the same time. So, you you know, once you see revivalism at work, now you can get an understanding of how um, genre updates itself. So it's not only working from the main from the margins of uh, of the mainstream into the mainstream, but it's also working by virtue of just simply reaching back and remembering. Um, and so in the case of reggae, for example, and Jimmy Cliff, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, this is actually Toots and the Maytals. So this goes down to the Toots and the Maytals line. Sorry about that. Oops, there we go. Okay, that's good. Um, I'll play the song while I do this. You can hear some actual reggae. Sorry about that. In any case, um, the deal with reggae that's so amazing to me is that, you know, it has a lot, its success has a lot to do with um, Island Records which was a record company based out of Jamaica. Um, but then transplanted to London and uh, Chris Greenwood, the, um, the executive over the record label, it became the largest um, subsidiary or uh, independent record label in the world at one point in time. And they ended up with U2 and um, you know, Cat Stevens and, um, and just some really magnificent artists, but they started uh, by mainstreaming reggae. And so they were distributing reggae records to, um, you know, re uh, Jamaican expats in London um, during the 60s. And then um, they stumbled upon Bob Marley and um, other fantastic uh, artists of the genre. And what they did was, um, to mainstream it, was that they took the lyrical 
specificity away about the struggle. You know, reggae is a protest uh, genre that's based on um, colonialism. And so they're tired of uh, European settlers taking over the islands and its resources. And so that historical specificity about that struggle is taken out of the lyrics and kind of in place of that, you get the sound of an electric guitar, which was completely foreign to um, the genre itself. And so that little shift right there was enough to do the trick. And it's also kind of fascinating that you've got, you know, the vo the protest is kind of taken away and it turns into just general angst. And then you have a symbol of, um, you know, the electric guitar is kind of an American as one of the, you know, it's a colony. We're, we were colonized, um, or we are the colonizers. Um, and so for that electric guitar to go over um, the historical sort of specificity of Jamaican um, outrage seems significant and a little bit outrageous. And so um, I just thought I'd point that out because that's the way that uh, reggae was mainstreamed by Island Records. Um, and, um, you know, white owned record company, but built on the, um, the success really primarily of, of Bob Marley. Um, okay. So that's, uh, we're listening to Toots and the Maytals right now in case you're wondering, Hey, 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 one of my favorites. And then, um, also country now in the 1970s has been established since the 60s and so it starts to splinter as well and so you get into progressive country and outlaw country and then finally into um you know alternative country in the 1990s but it really does take about a decade or so for a genre to have been in the mainstream before it starts to split apart into these kind of subsidiary genre subsidiary genres and so um glenn campbell Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson are all here. And that's Kenny Rogers who had his entry into it in, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Primarily, that's where he had most of his success. Um, and so these, uh, you know, outlaw country singers were kind of bucking the, um, not so much the Nashville sound as... Um, you know, what country music, it's not so much what it stood for, but what it sang about, I would say. Um, so this is a, for those of you into country music, this is an interesting um, area about what's the relationship between country from the 1960s uh, and outlaw country in particular. Okay, um, so what's going on with rock? So uh, rock is continuing to splinter. And so we've got um, Southern rock and jazz rock as two more permutations of the genre that have been uh, established for a while since the 50s. So now we're into the 70s. Um, so Southern rock and jazz rock, you've got, uh, I guess, jazz rock in particular. Um, the Elmer Brothers tend to represent that along with Southern rock. But Leonard Skinner and the band, um, and there are plenty of others, um, are less on the jazz rock side, I would say. Um, you know, and, you know, Levon Helm was from Arkansas. He's probably one of the the main connections of the band to um, to the South. But he settled in, uh, in Woodstock, New York. And so it's almost uh, reminds me of Credence uh, Clearwater Revival that was an L.A. band acting like they're a bunch of dudes from New Orleans and actually pulling it off. You know, um, I'm not saying that about the band, but image in the music business is highly plastic and malleable and can be formed and reformed. So don't always believe what you are seeing and hearing as um, God's, done, God's honest truth, as they say. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about disco and funk right now. Um, so... This guy's going to play a disco beat for us, which I think is really cool. We're going to do eighth notes on the hi-hat, quarter notes on the bass drum, and two and four on the snare. That's it. The hi-hat, we open every second beat, so it's 
So there you go. So this guy's got the disco beat going on. Um, it's close to funk, but it's more about the drive, whereas funk really plays deep in the pocket, meaning that it's messing with where you're anticipating the beat to be um, and really emphasizing that, but with um, instruments oftentimes different than you're expecting and then playing off of the beat to bring the beat even more into relief. Um, disco is a little bit more repetitive, uh, and so it is highly mainstreamable, I think, in that fact. Simplified lyrical harmonic content also um, speak to how this dance music be went so quickly into the mainstream. Okay, So we've seen these techniques before in mainstreaming. Um, Casablanca Records, uh, Donna Summer, Bad Girls. This is the very first disco uh, recording. So you can listen to that. Some of the main uh, exponents would be the Village People with YMCA and, and Macho Man, and then um, the Bee Gees with Staying Alive. And we'll, we'll see a Bee Gees thing in a second here. Um, and then you've got really cool hybrid things. We'll, we'll talk about funk in just a second um but uh you know casey and the sunshine band really good example of a band that brought both together funk and disco and so um you can check out this video when um when you watch the uh the video or uh, check out these powerpoints um something to notice here is that um, you know this is clearly a homemade video but this was a music this was you know a label released music video um, in the 1970s um, you see the kind of Elvis look uh, bell bottoms um, you know if you dig disco and funk you certainly heard of Casey and the Casey and the Sunshine Band and they have they were touring up until a few years ago they may still be touring um, this is just a fantastic tune. So a really good example of, a, of an integrated band um, there for the music. Everybody clearly having a good time and um, making money and having success while they're at it. So why not, you know? Pretty good video editing for the 70s. Talked a little bit about the Bee Gees. Um, you know, this is where their pinnacle occurred in Saturday Night uh, Fever. Um, this particular scene shows um, John Travolta, um, you know, doing his disco dance. And um, I wonder, okay, so yeah. Anyway, that's the movie Staying Alive, which was a big success, you know, after Grease, people were waiting for more Travolta, and so that's what they got was a disco-focused um, love story. Um, four years later, of course, you have uh, the recognition, and this is once again comedy and satire. We've seen um, cartoons doing this before. Comedy and satire coming in to spoof um, a genre that is kind of too ripe on the vine. It's been there for a while. It's done its thing and it's moved into the past. And so that's kind of the function of, um, of satire here. And this is from the movie Airplane, which is probably one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, but satire and comedy, when they, they poke fun at, at musical genres, they are indicating and helping them move into the, to the rearview mirror. So they're going into the past faster than they normally would because of this. Right, let me widen this out a little bit. Okay, so what's going on here is um, this guy's recounting his story as a as a as a sailor in the navy. Sees a girl that he likes. Asks the girl next to him. Uh, he says, "I think I'm dreaming. Why don't you pinch me?" And the guy's like, "Okay, you're kind of freaky. I'm gonna leave you alone." Um, but what happens is that this turns into the Staying Alive movie from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from uh you know the bg from staying alive in the bg so um 
it was kind of a rough bar, right? So this guy just got stabbed in the back and he's pointing to the knife and she thinks he's showing her a new dance move. At this point in time, he, you know, can't uh, resist and has to go out on the dance floor and he sees the girl and they have their disco moment. So this scene and the popularity of Airplane, as much as anything, spelled an end, uh, verified, kind of put the tombstone on the grave of disco music. Um, so, of course, under his Navy uniform, he's got a, uh, a disco get-up, right? Just like John Travolta. And they continue to do the, you know, hilarious interpretations. I think he throws her up in the air at some point in time. And it's like a long time before she comes down. Anyway, if you haven't seen Airplane and you like um, a good slapstick comedy, there you go. She's coming. She's coming. Whoa, whoa, whoa. guess he's eating some. <laughs> okay, so and this is finally, this is the nail in the coffin. And I think this is actually before Airplane. But there was a DJ in Chicago that was so angry about disco that he... Um, talked about a going to a Chicago White Sox game and it was a doubleheader and in between the two games he said if anybody who comes to the park can bring a record and you get in for 50 cents and then get like two free beers or whatever and so that's the DJ and uh, he called it the disco demolition so you bring your record out to center field um, during the uh the intermission and um he put like a quarter of a stick of dynamite in the pile or something and then it was a complete it was complete chaos after that um but you know you could just see that you know disco was not loved universally and apparently especially in chicago so um it's just a story that ends with complete chaos like i'll get it closer to the end and you can see that they got the police out there. People are setting fire to stuff. I mean, they finally realized that free beer and um, everything was not the best idea. Okay, so that's a look at, uh, at disco and funk and a little bit of, you know, revivalism and how some of these um, genres made it either quickly or slowly on into the mainstream and then what their deaths look like, especially uh, with disco here. So um, be standing by for more information on the quiz on Friday. As I mentioned, you've got the, um, you know, the Jazz Talk Dictionary one from last week will be combined with another smaller assignment from, from this week. All right. Thank you very much.